Merci, Arun. Uh, bonsoir. Good evening. Good day. My family of Rotary. It is such a pleasure for Tom and I to be able to speak to you today because we're going to talk about a topic that is very dear to both of us, and that is membership growth and development. And, you know, if you have heard me speak before on Zoom or if you've read any of the material in regional magazines or on our website, you know that I have been asking clubs and districts to become simply irresistible. And what that means in different parts of the world is different. You will know what that entails. It really means creating our Rotary events and our Rotary clubs so that as people come to join us, they feel a sense of belonging. When we are irresistible, the members who are with us will find it very difficult to leave. And those who are not yet with us will look and say, I'd really like to join that group. They're doing amazing things and having fun. And so when we talk about membership development, and new clubs and being irresistible, we're really talking about three things. And Tom and I are going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about how to attract members to our existing clubs, which is not easy. We're going to talk about how to retain members in our existing clubs, which is not easy. We're going to talk about developing new clubs and creating that culture, which is a bit easier. But all three of them require work. They are intentional strategies. They are things that we do on purpose, not by accident, so that we have an organization that continues to grow and has a thriving future. So, Tom, I'll turn the next, uh, next bit of the program over to you. Absolutely. So what we're going to focus on, and... Stephanie laid out the three types of growth mechanisms and surrounding all of that is also club culture. Um, so we're gonna be talking a little bit about that. But when it comes to the path forward, what Rotary International Growth Committee and its studies that it has conducted has shown is that we cannot move forward unless we develop new clubs. So what we wanna talk about today is how we're gonna form a new club, uh, what lessons we've learned from starting other clubs, what are the keys that all successful clubs that have formed have? And what are the opportunities for your area in starting new clubs? So Tom mentioned something important. He mentioned the word culture. Every Rotary Club has a culture. Put simply, that means how do we do things around here? How do we make people feel? And again, culture is intentional. If you're in a traditional club and you've been around for a long time, there's definitely a culture that you've developed. It's the way your club meetings are organized. It's how, how you do things. It's whether or not you, you recite the four-way test. It, it's how you greet people. All of those things play a, play a part in culture. So for us to think about our existing clubs, one thing we have to do up front is to do an assessment from time to time. We have to ask ourselves, at least annually, and maybe even more frequently, how are we doing as a club? And there are many ways that clubs can do that. You can do it formally by using one of the tools that you can find on Rotary's website, the club assessment documents like the Healthy Club Checklist or others, membership surveys, or you can do it informally simply by asking club members one-on-one -on -one or doing Survey Monkey or some other informal way. But it is the best way up front to get an idea of how the club is performing and how people are feeling. Once you know where your members fall on certain areas, when you meet, the day of the week you meet, where you meet, you're better able to take a look at, are there things that we might try that are a little bit different? And if they are, then you have an opportunity to create some change. 
The picture that you see on the screen right now was a snapshot taking at one of my club socials. And if you look at that picture, you can see everybody is smiling because one of the things that's very true about my club is that we have a culture of doing good in the world, but having a great time while we do it. Tom? So the first step in forming a club, and it's a very important step, is to find your champion. Uh, sometimes Stephanie refers to this person as the spark plug. You need someone who's got that passion, you know, has that gumption to go out there and bring in new members. It's the person who knows why you're forming the club. What is the purpose of the club? You know, people don't join a Rotary Club just to join a club. They join to do things. So doing fun service projects. This is a picture of Stephanie painting the outside of an apartment building in Korea. Um, and I remember that day in particular because it wasn't too long ago, but there was an adult male who came up and just was started to cry when she, he saw Stephanie because she was the embodiment of Rotary International. And his mother had been living in an apartment full of mold and without electricity. And the Rotarians came in and they refurbished the apartment, kept electricity running, did remodeling, put up nice wallpaper. So that's the kind of feeling we want to give our members. Um, now, where do you find your members? The best way to find your champion, your members, are the local supporters. People in your area know that you are involved in Rotary. Um, you know, you might have asked people to join the club that you're in now, uh, but they might have said no because it doesn't meet at a time that's convenient for them, or they don't like to have a fixed cost meal that they have to budget for. So that's why you start a new club to reach more people of action in your area. So another important idea is to think about recruiting the right members. You know, when your original Rotary Club formed, you you thought carefully about inviting the right kind of people, people who were just like you, who shared the core values of our organization, fellowship, leadership, integrity, diversity, and service. So when we start new clubs, that same message holds true. We're not talking about just getting people to come and fill seats. We're talking about people who understand the right way to be a Rotarian. So you know people. These are people who are around you. They're in your area. They're in your circle of friends. They're your associates that you work with. And don't forget about diversity. Diversity means a lot of different things, not just gender, although that's certainly one of them. It could also mean background. It could mean socioeconomic status. It could mean a lot of different things. Because when we bring diversity into our clubs, that means we have people who think and act differently. And that's the beauty of an organization. If we all were the same, if we all were the same gender, we we're all the same uh, thinkers, then we wouldn't really get anywhere because no one would ever have new ideas. Stephanie, you couldn't be more right. You know, when we started, this picture is when we started the world's first ever veterans club. And it was interesting because the president and the vice president, they were both males and they were um, from the 82nd Airborne, which in the U.S. was a, a paratrooper as they jump out of planes. And our two membership chairs, um, they were both named Kathy and their nicknames were Kathy Army and Kathy Navy because one was in the Army and one was in the Navy. Um, and it's interesting because they had diverse opinions from the two um, presidents and vice president of the clubs. The president and vice president wanted to grow this club as fast as possible, get in as many people as possible. And Kathy Army and Kathy Navy, what they wanted to do was to interview everyone and make sure that it was a good fit. So, of course, the right answer was a combination of the two. So that diversity of thought makes your club stronger, your new club stronger, and it helps weather storms that come up. So one of the one of the things I hear frequently about starting new clubs, whether they're standalone clubs or any of the new models, satellite clubs, corporate clubs, any of them, I hear Rotarians say, 
no, we don't want to start a new club because our members are going to, going to gravitate to that and we'll lose members in our original club. Well, we're here to tell you that that is a complete myth because all of the surveys and research that Rotary does about new clubs show that 88% of the people coming into these new clubs were actually new to Rotary. They were not members coming from other clubs. So the third step, what we found in forming new clubs, is it's better to start with a few people meeting to determine what they want. Um, there'll be time for a large organizational meeting later. Um, but when you get a few people together, it's interesting how you can focus on commonalities. If you're going to be an in-person club, what day you're going to meet, where you're going to meet, how you're going to meet. Is it going to be in person? Is it going to be virtual? What are your socials going to be? What are your service projects going to be? We found that if you bring a bunch of people together, um, it kind of fractures into different groups. But if you meet with just a couple people over lunch and find out what they have in common and what unites them, um, that helps a lot. And this is especially true in our cause-based clubs. Now, a cause-based club is like a regular Rotary Club, but they focus on one particular cause. Yes, they do the five air avenues of service, but they are there to serve a particular group. Um, we started a club to end human trafficking, and now there's a dozen of them around the world. So their speakers are around that cause. Um, their service projects are around that cause. Now it's interesting, our biggest problem with Rotary membership is people leaving. We don't have a problem bringing them in, but people leave. And they also, 10% leave in the first year, and just over 50% leave within the first three years. What we found out is these cause-based clubs keep the new members there longer. And let's face it, after you've been there for three years, you're like all of us on this call. You have your friends and you end up staying. So these cause-based clubs, is it like a magnet that draws people in the community together so they stay together longer until they know about Rotary and then they stay in Rotary. And since you have a special passion for water and sanitation projects, that could be an area that you start to look at in terms of starting some of these smaller cause-based clubs, satellite clubs, or even Rotaract clubs, um, because that's, that's a special mission that you have. So I mentioned this earlier, you see on the, on the screen now, uh, one of our membership satisfaction surveys. It's really important to find out what members want. We can't guess at what, what they want. We need to ask them what they want. And that's one of the, one of the first steps of any kind of endeavor, whether it's starting a new club or whether it's thinking about how to bring some life into your existing club, you really have to start with asking people what they want. Stephanie, you're so right. Um, what Stephanie and I see is the biggest mistake that people make when forming a new club, especially if they haven't formed a club or the district hasn't formed a club before, is they want to make it just like their club. Well, Stephanie and I are what I call in traditional clubs. She calls them legacy clubs. Um, but my club meets at a Tuesday morning at 730 at a country club. Well, I've already asked all my friends that I know that I worship with, that I work out with, that I work with uh, to join my club. And it was right for a lot of people. When my year as president, we brought in 31 people into my club. But what I soon discovered is there's certain things about my club that don't work. So we don't want to start a mini club of the club that we're in. What we want to do is we want to ask them what they want, and we want to meet them where they are, meet their schedule, meet their time frame. Um, and then the next step is securing funds. So when we secure funds, there's an old way of doing it, and then there's a new way of doing it. Um, in many parts of the world, and this is true in North America, most of the new clubs that were started, and we don't start enough clubs in North America, Stephanie will tell you we've only started 52 last year, and there's some districts in some area of the world that started that many in, in, in their district. Um, but it's a mistake to just let the biggest, oldest, largest clubs start uh, these clubs because they're the ones that have money. Uh, usually the first club that 
a district starts as a young professional club, which is good. But we want all clubs, whether they be small, medium, or large, to be able to start a new club. And there's different ways to do it. And sometimes we hear, well, we can't start a club unless you have money. Well, but you know, the re reality is um, when we start clubs, you can start a club for as little as 1000 to 1500 US dollars. There's certain things that are nice to have, such as name bags or name badges or a case to hold the name badges or pull-up banners or a bell and a gavel if you want to have those kind of things. But what Stephanie and I find out is if you get other clubs, not just one club to give dollars and let that be the only club contributing, but let all the districts around the area and all the clubs around the district in a particular area give in kind different gifts like give a microphone, give a podium, um, because then all of them have buy-in into this. The other thing that we've seen that is a, a new way of doing things is to have a pro-growth policy in your district. Your district can actually meet, um, if you have a corporate board or you have a governance board, they can decide not to charge any fees for the first year to give this new club a start. So, of course, they're going to have to pay international dues but if you waive those dues not only does it help a club that's getting started but it also lets that club know that they have support from the district and then invite all those people who have contributed um, to your chartering ceremony so it's really important at the beginning to get people together and hold organizational meetings what that means is People are going to have questions about what is Rotary? What's the purpose? What do you do? How do I fit in? So at your organizational meetings, you certainly can answer some of those questions. When you think about having a meeting, you want to make sure that it's a free meeting and that it's easy for people to get to, a central location. And at the organizational meeting, this is where you have an opportunity to find out who has a passion for leadership so that you can choose officers. It's helpful if you do use a PowerPoint because that can help keep you organized just as we're doing today. So the next step is not a scary step. So many times when people think about starting a new club, they think there's all this paperwork and it's really hard to do. There's only five pieces of paperwork and actually, number two there, you don't even have to do because RI does that for you. They just put your name in the standard club constitution. So um, you do an application for a Rotary Club. It's only four pages. For a Rotary Act Club, it's three pages. And a Satellite Club, it's only two pages. Um, and the last page of it is probably the hardest part, and that's the member list. Um, so you can fill that in when people, members are coming in. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Now, the bylaws, you can specify whatever you want to do in your bylaws, and you can make that different. But again, the club constitution's got to be standard. But those few items is all you need to do to form a club, paperwork-wise. And so Tom mentioned uh, the actual application. You can see her on the screen that they basically have just a few sections for you to fill out with the name of the club, some information about how to contact the club, who the advisor is going to be. And then the second uh, form you see is the certification form and that's for Rotaract. So it is, um, again, a very simple form. There are just a few questions to answer. Uh, so it shouldn't be a scary process for anyone. So the hardest part about filling out the form is getting the officers. Now, you can ask them, and they usually, um, people volunteer, and it's pretty easy to do. Um, what Stephanie and I have in our experience forming new clubs have found out the hardest um, position to fill is the Rotary Foundation Chair. And you know, if you listen to what Stephanie said about 88% are new to Rotary, well, that's why it's hard to pick a Rotary Foundation chair because a lot of them don't know about what the Rotary Foundation does. Um, and if the few members who have been in Rotary know about it, they may not, that might not be their passion. So what you can do is you could 
appoint a person to that position if they agree to it. And then after a year or so, you could change that person out. But again, there'll be someone who steps up. You just have to ask. Another way you could deal with that is to do something my club did. We recognized that as new clubs were, were forming, in our case, we started a satellite club. We knew that people were new to Rotary. So every eight weeks, we have a special social that is dedicated for the new satellite club. And only one or two members of our original Rotary Club go. And the whole purpose of the social is to talk Rotary. So yes, we have beverages. Yes, we have some food. But the two Rotarians who go speak to the members of the new satellite about topics in Rotary. So that's our way of helping new members get a handle on what are the important elements that they need to know in order to function in Rotary. That's a really good way to do it, Stephanie. So one question that we often get is, do we need to formalize our entity? Uh, do we need to have a corporation? Um, whatever your area has in the way of state and government uh, regularities. RI does not, Rotary International does not require you to have a formal corporate structure. However, what we found out is in many areas of the world, if you want to open a bank account in the name of the entity, it's good to have a formal corporate structure, a partnership, a limited liability company, a corporation, whatever it is the most appropriate in your area. Um, you know, a lot of times we see clubs form without that. And then the software is in one person's name or the bank account is in one person's name and they might be guaranteeing payment um, of a certain amount to keep that account uh, live. So what we found out is for continuity purposes, it's good to do this. Now, I would wait personally until after your group, your club has been approved by Rotary International because when you file that application, sometimes the name that you requested is changed to add a country identifier or an area identifier. You don't want to have to go back to the governmental agency and say, hey, we need to do a name change because that's just another form and maybe another payment to the government. So get your entity formed with Rotary International, then form your corporate entity, um, and then open up your bank account and you'll be in business. The constitution we already talked about, that's something that you shouldn't we'll begin again with that. I made this mistake when I formed my first club with the help of others. Um, I redid the constitution and it wasn't approved by Rotor International. But the bylaws is a document that you can actually put in things that are different about your club. So we mentioned before that the heart hardest part about filling out the paperwork is the last page, which is a page for each of the individuals that are joining your club. Like Stephanie said, there's going to be information you have to put in. They'll want your uh, each member's home address, a secondary home address, a business address, a phone number, a secondary phone number. Do you want your um, Rotary Magazine electronic or in print? You know, those kind of things. But there is an easy way to do this. If you call club and district support in your area and you ask them for this Excel spreadsheet that you see, you could actually fill that out and just have one sheet instead of 30 different sheets if you have 30 chart members. Um, the key to filling out the sheet is don't leave anything blank. If someone doesn't have a middle name, just put none applicable or NA. Um, because if you leave a lot of blanks, then club and district support is going to call you and they're going to put a higher scrutiny level on their review. So just don't leave any blanks. But if there's not an answer, you could say no answer. And the key with the payment is make sure that your number of charter members matches the $15. Don't Once you submit your application, you might end up getting a few new members. Don't add those members until after your application has been approved because if you revise your application, it gets put at the bottom of the pile. You can still call them charter members at your organizational night. And so a final message is be sure to celebrate. Have a chartering event. Uh, whether you are an in-person new club 
or a virtual club, you need to schedule an evening or another time during the week where you all get together and celebrate this new group that has formed. Because remember, you are a gift to the community. Each time we form new clubs, we're presenting our communities with a gift. So I can't stress how important this is. I can't stress it enough. It's very important. Plus, it also gives the members of the new club the idea that they have just become a part of something special. And of course, if you can, invite the media. Um, it can be your local newspapers, it can be radio stations, it can be people in your district who are skilled at social media. Take lots of pictures and make sure that you post them prominently to help celebrate this new gift to the community. I couldn't agree with you more, Stephanie. I remember when I started my first club with the help of others, my district governor said, you need to have a party. And I was thinking, oh, I just started this club. I want to take a break. <laughs> but he was so right. Um, and the other opportunity it gives you is you can invite the family members of those charter members. It's interesting how when you're forming a club and you need to get to the 20 members, that there will be five or six people on the sideline not sure if they want to start because they don't know if you're actually going to get it started. But as soon as you charter, then they come in because they know it's going to happen. And, you know, the family members, they could be your next members that join the club. So the other thing you want to do is after you get formed is you want to make sure that your service projects match with the function of the club. And this is and the purpose of the club. And this is especially true with cause-based clubs. You know, when we started the Veterans Club, the first project we did was we redid the first floor of a veterans home for homeless veterans to put in a pool table and foosball and, and all those kind of things so they could have camaraderie. Because remember, it's not about being a veteran when you join the Veterans Club. It's about serving veterans. Um, this is a project that Stephanie and I worked on in Minnesota where we were making uh, sanitary uh, napkin packs for women uh, around the world that we took to various places when we went to Guatemala, Honduras. Um, but again, this was important to that club because it was one of the goals that they were working on. You just have to match the service projects with the focus of the club. So this slide is a reminder of, of what the keys to success are. So when you're starting a new club, these are five things you need to remember. Very, very, very important. It's, it's critical that you find a passionate champion or champions with an S, the people who are going to also be on the bandwagon with you, who understand the importance of growing Rotary. You also want to make sure that your group is focused around friendship and fellowship and that you have fun in addition to serving. Number three is making sure that there is this desire to serve. Rotary clubs serve their communities. The communities start in our backyards, but they don't end there. So clubs will become involved in community activities and then spread out and look for international service opportunities. New clubs started with friends, and we all have them. There are friends, there are relatives, there are associates, our neighbors. So that's where we need to share the message of Rotary. Non-Rotarians, by and large, have a perception that Rotary isn't for them because despite the fact that for years we have marketed and told our stories, most people think that Rotary is rich old men eating out. And that is not what we are. Look at the screen here. I mean, we are so very different and diverse. So we need to remind people what Rotary really is. And finally, make sure that you have the support from your club if you're starting a satellite or from the district if you're starting a new club because that becomes critical as you move forward. So we're often asked, where's the biggest opportunities to form new clubs? So what we've seen is when you start a club, it seems to inspire other clubs. So when we started our Veterans 
club a few years ago, they were starting popping up all over the world. Um, and suicide prevention clubs also popped up because of that. And human trafficking clubs are very um, prevalent right now. There's a lot of our Rotarians um, who are focused on this cause. And I think we can bring a lot more people into Rotary with that. There's autism clubs. Environmental clubs are great. You know, the one club that every district should have, and Stephanie uh, talks about this often, is a virtual club. If your district doesn't have a passport club or a club where people who can't make Rotary meetings but still want to be involved in Rotary, every district should have that. So if someone's leaving your district, what you can do is you can call them up and say, why are you leaving? And it might be, oh, it's too expensive, too much time. Well, do you know that we have a passport club and the dues um, are very minimal because you don't have to pay for food. And it's a way you can join virtually, even if you're a pilot or you're in a profession where you can't make meetings during the day. Literacy clubs, WASH projects, as Stephanie mentioned. Um, Australia, they have two clubs that are forming now for homelessness and really any place that you can serve others. And, you know, this list is not exhausted. You know, it's in, it's inherent in us as Rotary leaders to take a look at our communities to see where there may be people who want to serve but who have not yet been introduced to the concept of Rotary. When I was in India last year, I had an opportunity to meet the president of a Rotary club for visually impaired people. So most of the people in the club were either blind or had vision issues, but yet they were all interested in serving their community. So we just need to open our eyes and look around, and I know we can find people everywhere around the world who are interested in doing just that. So thank you for letting us share our ideas today about, about new club development and a little bit about what what we can do with our existing clubs to help attract members. Remember, we want to attract members, retain members, and then start new clubs because that is the way we will grow Rotary. And we are happy to take any questions that may pop up. I'm not sure how we're going to handle that. Disha, uh, maybe maybe you have some ideas about, or Arun, how are we handling questions? Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie uh, and Tom. I guess this has been a very fruitful session, especially for me, because uh, for Mauritius, I'm the incoming new club development uh, uh, chair. So, uh, with it, so I guess it has been very enlightening. And uh, I, I have had this conversation with my district governor-elect, Marie, uh, DG Marie-Francoise, in relation to how to develop new clubs in the district and also consolidate. Because one of the questions that I had asked her is uh, whether new club development is uh, about developing new clubs or consolidating uh, existing ones. So I think I have my answer today. Uh, very importantly, uh, we have, before we proceed to questions, I know uh, DG Ludes uh, has a few remarks and uh, he, uh, I would pass on to him if he has any questions and a few remarks in relation to the state of uh, the status of the, of the district in relation to new club development. Uh, Ludes, uh, DG Ludes, c'est à toi. Bien, merci beaucoup. Uh, J'ai bien écouté les deux intervenants. Uh, J'ai appris beaucoup de choses. Et je vais vous partager euh, mon expérience personnelle, puisque j'ai été membre fondateur de deux clubs. Pour le premier club, je suis venu en tant qu'invité. Et je n'étais pas partie prenante pour la création de ce club. Par contre, au bout de 20 ans après, j'ai décidé de créer un nouveau club en concertation avec mon ancien club, et je l'ai créé de la manière suivante, c'est-à-dire que j'ai pris mon carnet d'adresse et je me suis aperçu que j'avais plus de 50 amis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Et j'ai envoyé un email à ces 50 amis et j'ai fait une réunion. La première réunion, je n'ai pas parlé du tout de Rotary. Euh, j'ai parlé de l'humanitaire, j'ai parlé de service, j'ai parlé d'aide à la personne, j'ai parlé de social, mais pas de Rotary. Et c'est au bout de la troisième ou la quatrième réunion euh, que j'ai commencé à parler de Rotary. 
Et c'est comme ça que j'ai créé le club. Moi, je pense que pour créer un club, il faut oser. Euh, beaucoup de Rotariens n'osent pas. Et je pense que c'est la seule façon de, de pouvoir créer un nouveau club, c'est d'oser. Euh, faire un peu le bilan euh, autour de soi, euh, dans sa région, euh, de ses amis. Et je crois que on a, pas tous les Rotariens ont, ont cette capacité. Mais je pense que si on ose, si on veut, on peut créer d'autres clubs. Et aujourd'hui, ben, mon club se porte très bien. Euh, on est à une vingtaine de membres, on a démarré à 30, mais et, euh, le club fonctionne très bien et on fait de, de très beaux projets. Et je pense, après mon mandat de gouverneur, je prendrai mon bâton de pèlerin et je crois que j'irai inciter d'autres personnes à créer des clubs. Bon, déjà, dans notre district, pour cette année, à la fin de mon mandat, je pense qu'on aura trois nouveaux clubs dans le district. Donc, voilà ce que je voulais partager avec vous. You're absolutely right, Governor. We have to be daring. I said earlier that we have to be intentional. New clubs don't happen by accident. It's because leaders get out of our, our seats and we go and we make them happen. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing it. Merci. Uh, OK. Merci, uh, DG Ludes. Ce uh, fut un plaisir. Uh, maintenant, je passe la parole à, 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 des, à, à, à président nommé uh, Navin. Navin, uh, uh, président nommé Navin, uh, I pass on to you. And uh, please uh, start with the questions that we have received. Uh, thank you, Arun. Uh, so, good evening uh, to President-elect uh, Stéphanie and Dom. Uh, we have the first question. We have around seven, eight questions. So, the first one is, uh, is it necessary to create new clubs, even if we have a population of 1.2 million and 32 Rotary clubs in Mauritius? Take it, Tom. Um, That's for you. We would say yes. The reality is, mm -hmm. yes, we have a lot of Rotarians, but just think of how many people that we could add, add to Rotary. If we reached out to those potential people of action where they are and ask them, why have you, haven't you joined Rotary yet? You know, it's interesting when I asked all my friends to join, there were some that couldn't come to my meeting because as I said, I met at 7.30 a.m. Well, in the U.S., many people have to take their children to the bus stop at that time so they can get on a bus to go to school. Um, or there might be a young professional who can't take off early in the morning because they have to be at work at that time. So instead of saying you have to fit into this box that is rotary, we can throw out that box and say, how do you want to serve the world? And we can help them. I mean, we have district grants, we have global grants, we have all these things to offer. Um, but what we really need and what our strength is the people So yes, we should form new clubs to capture those people that we haven't yet captured. I know we have 1.4 million Rotarians and Rotaractors, but I want to have 10 million. Thank you for the question. And let me add that, you know, whether or not clubs realize it, all of our clubs have built-in attrition. Because without even trying, we lose members every year. People pass away, people move, People get disengaged from Rotary and take off. There are lots of reasons why people don't stay in our clubs. So unless we are intentionable, intentional rather, about looking for new members and can quickly diminish and become a much less number. So we must be intentional. And let's face it, there's enough that needs to be done in the world, more good that needs to be done in the world. Yes. So says, thank you for that answer. Uh, for the next question, what, what would be the culture which a new club should embrace? Well, that depends to some extent on what kind of new club it is. If that new club is made up of similar individuals and you, again, Um, ask them what they're interested in, what they want. You'll get that information from the members as they come into the club. So some, some new clubs 
have a culture that's built around um, having a little more formalness to it. Some clubs are less formal and are more interested in having fun while they serve. It's the members themselves who will develop the culture of the club. And that's why starting new clubs is so much easier because you create the culture as people come in. Trying to change the culture of an existing club, a traditional club, is much harder. It's not impossible, but it's much harder. Navin. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, can uh, uh, the other question is, uh, what would be the culture which a new club should embrace? Well, I, I've just uh, talked about that from my perspective. Tom, do you have anything to, to add? Uh, yes, I do. I really appreciate your answer, Stephanie, and you're absolutely right. And i uh, just like to give an example to, to bring it home. You know, when I was district governor, we were really working on diversity. You know, I live in Minneapolis, which is where George Floyd was murdered. So we were working on that. And the other thing we were working on was gender parity during our year. And at the end of my year as district governor, we went from 30% female to almost 33% female. So we were doing an analysis at the end of the year, um, trying to figure out what did we do? Because we did it right, but we wanted to know what we did right so we can repeat it. And we looked at, and we don't have, because of US privacy laws, racial data. We don't keep that at Rotary International, but we do keep gender data. And it's interesting because when we looked at how we moved that needle, it was with our new clubs. So our um, environmental club had over 50% female members. Our end human trafficking club had over 60% female members. And we started a, a club called the Network for Empowering Women. That had almost 70% females. Those three clubs by themselves moved the needle. So what we started to realize is we looked at our older clubs and they seem to be declining in numbers, but our newer clubs are growing in numbers, but the newer clubs come more diverse. They have a culture that is more diverse. So sometimes we can solve our problems in Rotary by forming new clubs. Thank you. Okay. Um, the other question that we have is how to avoid erosion of club culture if you have mass recruitment? How to avoid erosion of culture if you have mass recruitment? You need to tell me more about what that means. What is mass recruitment? So, for example, if you have, uh, from what we've been told, uh, is if you have uh, uh, 12 to 13 members and uh, you get approached by another 12 or 20 uh, or 13 members, it's possible for people to bring new culture to the club. So how do you avoid uh, the erosion of the club culture? Well, you know, if the if people come to an existing the club that has formed and what they're seeking, what they're interested in doesn't match what that first group has, there is a message there. And the message is they have an opportunity to form a different club or to become a satellite of a different club that more closely matches what they're interested in. When an original group of 12 to, to, to 30 get together, they're going to form around causes or interests or ways of doing things that make sense for them. If another group happens to look at that and it doesn't fit, then our recommendation is that they look for other clubs or they look to form their own group that will more closely match what it is they have in mind. Okay. Um, the question the 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 question that I also have is does new club creation not affect cohesion of existing clubs in the district if yes how to mitigate 
So I'm really glad you asked that question. I'm really glad you asked the past question because both of them bring up the point that a culture is always changing. You know, Stephanie defines culture as the things, how we get things done in a club. Well, every day or, you know, throughout the year, you have new people coming in, you have other people leaving. Well, that culture changes. And what a club wants today might be different from a year from now. So I'm very glad Stephanie brought up the point, we should do it once a year. That's why, because it is. Now, clubs are different. The club next door to a club, even if they're in the same city, they're different. But we do not find that, that those differences between the club breaks club apart. Just like Stephanie was saying, diversity within a club makes it stronger because you have different viewpoints. Diversity within a district and having different kinds of clubs makes it stronger. We have a pride club in our club. They do different kinds of fundraisers than other folks do. Our veterans club, they help the other clubs clean their veterans memorial. And they have other clubs have a signing at the holidays of cards for the military. They ask our veterans club to help. The end human trafficking clubs, they go speak to other clubs about what they're doing. So diversity in a district doesn't break it apart, it makes it stronger. Okay. And uh, uh, we have another question. How about public image chair as an officer? The three key positions are foundation, membership, and public image. Public image is the key in promoting your club and visibility. Absolutely correct. Those three go hand in hand. Um, you know, and I mentioned uh, during the presentation that sometimes non-Rotarians have the wrong impression about Rotary. So we really have we really have to promote Rotary to an internal audience as well as to an external audience. And my favorite actually is speaking to non-Rotarians. Let's face it, everybody on this Zoom call knows what Rotary is. And you love Rotary just like I do. Tom and I love Rotary. You love it. Look, here's here we, we're, we're on this call. We could be doing so many different things, but we love Rotary. But it's the people who are not on the call. It's the people who are in our communities who don't get us, who don't understand. And so I always tend to talk to non-Rotary audiences by starting to, to telling them that we've changed. You know, we're, we're an old organization. We were started in 1905 and not very many things last for more than 100 years, but we have. But in addition to lasting that long, we also have recognized that the world has changed. And so we have changed too. We brought in women in the late 80s. Our council in 2016, our council on legislation opened up the doors and created new meeting models for us. That's where e-clubs came from and, and passport clubs and satellite clubs. So the message to people who aren't in Rotary is that if you have the heart and the hands for service and you have the ability to understand and accept the core values of Rotary, then there's a place for you. There's a way for you to fit into our organization. So for me, the public image message to non-Rotarians is even more important than our, mess than our internal messages, although those are critical too. We need to continue to tell the story so that existing Rotarians understand more about the mission of, of who we are and what we do. Okay. Uh, another question. Previously, we used to have classification as a criteria. Now, uh, as criteria, now we are also looking at satellites or clubs with the same interest or for the for the same cause. How does the array reconcile both ideas, and is it a favored direction? Tom, you can you can handle that first. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Rotary no longer requires that there be only one classification. And Arun, I'd like to share a story with you. You know, Rotary could have had me work for 17 more years for free if they would have let me in when I first tried to join in 1996. <laughs> but I was an assistant district attorney in the town I lived in. And my boss, she had the only law enforcement classification. So I wasn't allowed to join. I joined the JCs. Um, but it was interesting when I was asked to join Rotary again after I moved to another location. Um, and I, I thought about it. And I was like, well, Rotary didn't want me then. Maybe Rotary doesn't need me now. Um, 
And, you know, the only reason I came back is because my friend asked me about two dozen times. So I learned a lesson in persistence and how important it is because I went to my first meeting. I was hooked and I loved it. So classifications um, are no longer required. And really, if we want to grow Rotary, it's not um, it's not practical. You know, the grassroots of that was to give people an opportunity to exceed um, in their area. If you had a realtor or you're, you were an attorney, they didn't want competition originally is what I understand why they had that classification system. But now there are so many different attorneys. You have a divorce attorney, a corporate attorney, a real estate attorney, uh, a wills and estates attorney. Same with other kinds of classifications. So we're about networking, but we're also about service. And Stephanie always says we need more hearts and hands to do more good in the world. So let's not enforce the classifications because it really doesn't have a place for Rotary anymore. Did at one time, but not anymore. Thank you. But the way we do look at classifications now is uh, in terms of diversity. So, you know, if there is a club that's looking you know, I always tell clubs, look at your community. And if your community, your club mirrors your community, then you have a handle on the future. And if it doesn't, you have an opportunity. So that means a lot of different things. Of course, it means gender, but it could also mean occupation. It could, it could mean so many different things. Age, it could mean, you know, a tremendous number of things. And certainly classification is one of them. Okay. Because there's a, there's a common joke in our district. Uh, when two dentists tried to join a club, one was one joined under the classification of dentist, the other one uh, as tooth extractor. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and the other question is, what are WASH projects? WASH projects. WASH is the water and sanitation uh, acronym that we use for projects that deal with um, that that part of our, our focus area. Okay. And uh, we have uh, we have one question, well, two questions from uh, our district officer for membership, uh, district officer Hans. Um, I do have a question. Can we transform an existing classical club into a focus club? Is it absolute, it is absolutely key to retaining existing members? All right, Tom. Yes, we have had clubs that have successfully transferred from one type of club to another type of club, and it's not any formal paperwork. We had a club in Houston, Texas, that was um, around speech making, and that was, um, you know, their emphasis. And it was losing members to it only had a few members left. They actually changed that into a veterans club, and they got a whole bunch of new members. So, yes, um, but I'd caution you to make sure that you, you do it intentionally, like Stephanie says, and ask the members what they want. Because sometimes you'll have a silent majority and not know it. Um, and then you'll have a, a vocal minority who is um, pushes things to a certain way. You know, we once had a club, the president called up and said that it was a small club, about 22. And he said that half of his members wanted to do away with the four-way test and the other half wanted to keep it. Well, um, I didn't go into, you can't do away with the four-way test without a council legislation, but I just said do a survey because he wanted to know what to do and call me back. They did a survey, they called us back, and what we found out, there was only two people who wanted to do away with the four-way test and 20 wanted to keep it, of or the, that same percentage for the number that responded. So a lot of times you can use that survey as a tool to go back to your club or district and say, the majority have spoken and they want this. Because when Stephanie was talking about the importance of surveys, it gives your members an opportunity to feel like they have been heard, especially if you communicate what the survey says and you actually make some of the changes if it makes sense for your club or district to make them. Again, the buy-in. Okay. Uh, another question from our district of for membership. Uh, diversity of actions causes is great, but the practice of Rotary as per Rotary core values, should stay coherent. In this sense, it remains a challenge to create a lot of new clubs, while the historical older clubs tend to keep a more conservative stand about what Rotary is or should remain. Inevitably, a gap is already existing. Stephanie, 
So that is true. We have historical clubs and um, some areas of the world, it's hard for them to change. I mean, if we speak to Vietnam, you know, Stephanie and I have realized they want to change, 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 change. But you go to Thailand and they very much respect their elders and their elders do not want to change. Um, so in that area, when you want to respect the people that have the history and they like the tradition, you can start a new club that has new traditions. And then that way you don't insult your current members. You know, Stephanie is good about saying that when you are going through a change model, don't ever be heavy handed and force that change on individuals, but rather the individuals communicate what the change is gonna be, paint that beautiful picture of what the club can do, more members, more funds raised for the foundation, and then the people who are resistant to that change, we don't want to lose them. Give them um, certainty that it's going to be okay. Okay. Uh, in general, the only one who likes change is a baby in a wet diaper. So <laughs> as leaders, when we, when we are looking at um, making changes, it's important that we help people understand how that change is going to make their life better or make their club better. That's what our role is as leaders in change management. And if you have a club that's resistant to change, and we all know those clubs, you can make small changes. Uh, Stephanie and I were at a Pets one time where we asked all the president-elects, what's the one change you're going to make? And there was a gentleman named Troy, and Troy says, I want pie for dessert. And everyone laughed because people had grand changes, and his change seemed to be simple, have a dessert that people like. Well, we ran into Troy. We didn't know his last name, so we called him Troy the Pie Guy. We ran into Troy the Pie Guy a few years later, and we asked him if he got his pie, and he had his pie, and they kept the pie because he kept his whole um, president line of his club um, in the midst of the change. But what he, he said it caused a big change, that people started making other changes, at first small changes and big changes, and his club went from being a club resistant to change that won to a club that was accepting of innovation. And they grew to be the second largest club in their district. So you don't always have to be, start with a big change. You can do a small change. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, we have a question from President Ravi Rambojou. Can we create a fellowship that is based only for Mauritius instead of creating an international fellowship where we need to find members from five different countries? This can create more Rotarian bonding on common causes and projects. Not currently, because the requirements for a fellowship is that it is international. So I would say that if you wanted to create something locally, that you create it, but it wouldn't be a fellowship. It would be a group of like-minded people who were interested in that particular whatever that particular area is. Okay. Uh, next question is uh, in French, but then I'll translate it. Peut-on instaurer un système de motivation pour inciter à la création de nouveaux clubs? So can we establish a motivation system to encourage the creation of new clubs? Um, we have done that. And one of the ways we're doing that is exactly what we've done here this evening. Um, by, by holding these kinds of seminars, by, by talking about this, by writing about it, by hoping that you as leaders will go through your district and you know, continue to share the message about how important it is to start new clubs. This is where the motivation starts. We want all of you to, to be inspired by um, the message that Tom and I share about how important it is to start new clubs. Uh, we have one question from Imran Ghaznavi from Pakistan. Hello. Uh, he's, <laughs> what, are, what about nationality based clubs based in other, uh, in other than country, home country? I didn't catch the question. So basically it's about what about clubs in, based in other, other than home country. So we do have examples of that in Chicago. They have two 
um, Hispanic clubs. Um, there are Latina clubs in other places. So yes, it works well with in countries that have a large expat populations. Um, and Imran's the kind of individual I know that he's going to make things happen regardless of what the policies say. And if it works, we'll get the policies to catch up later. We have to grow Rotary. It's important that we do it now, not wait. Okay. Uh, two more questions. Uh, one is, can Rotarians not able to attend meetings regularly, but willing to help become honorary members? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can Rotarians not able to attend meetings regularly, but willing to help become honorary members? So instead of them being regular members, can they become honorary members? My initial reaction to that is um, that if there are a group of people interested in, in promoting uh, the work that's being done in a community, that that would be more accurately done as a Rotary Community Corps. Community Corps members are not Rotarians, but they are people in the community who are interested in serving and make the, making the community better as a, stand, as a stand alongside to the local Rotary Club. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a, a question in French that we would like to try, uh, that, that is, peut-on créer un incubateur pour la création de nouveaux clubs afin d'éviter la disparition rapide et garantir leur pérennité? Which means, can we create an incubator for the creation of new clubs in order to prevent their rapid disappearance and ensure their sustainability? Interesting question. Tom, do you have any, any thoughts on incubators? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. You know, the reality is when you talk about membership, people focus on it. You are all leaders on this call today. If we set up a group in North America, we set up innovative club advocates, which meet regularly with districts to help them start new clubs. There's all these misconceptions that it's hard to start a new club. It's difficult to start a new club. We can give you all kinds of examples where that's just not the case. So having incubators and bringing them around to other groups and letting people know the truth that it's not hard to start new clubs, that'll get people excited about it and they'll do it. You know, it's interesting because when we go to a district and we talk to a lot of districts, a lot of districts haven't started club for 10 years or more. But once they start that first club, within a few years, they start several other clubs because they start realizing it brings a lot of energy. It doesn't cannibalize their existing firm. So yes, the more we do it, the more we show how it can be done, the more we talk about it, the better things will be, the more clubs will start. Thank you. Okay, and uh, we have, uh, we have uh, one comment from uh, the district governor-elect from District 9010. Uh, that he has uh, he has developed uh, an incentive system in relation to uh, having PHFs for every president who creates a new club. So this is something uh, good. Uh, District 9010 is Morocco, great, great. Algeria, mm -hmm. Britannia. Uh, and the last question, I think uh, th this uh, this is uh, we we have kept the best for the last. Uh, is it possible to remove? Uh, all uh, contributions, uh, district tax or uh, district uh, tax or Rotary International uh, contribution for all new clubs uh, per capita for the districts uh, to develop themselves? That's a question for the Council on Legislation or for the Rotary Foundation. Uh, if you're talking about contributions, um, you have to keep in mind that we are an international organization, so um, decisions like that would either be made by the board of directors or by a motion by the Council on Legislation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I will. Uh, that we have a few questions, but then I guess uh, this should be it for this evening. 
uh, I will pass on to uh, the uh, President Diksha to to start uh, to, to for the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, R.I.P. Stephanie and uh, P.D.G. Tom. Thank you. Well, uh, due to time constraint, uh, we apologize to those whose uh, questions have not been answered. But uh, hopefully, there will be a next session next time. And uh, well, uh, as we come to the end of our seminar, webinar, I would like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to everyone who has contributed to make uh, this event uh, a success. First and foremost, our heartfelt thanks to Stephanie and Tom for their insightful presentation, your dedication to Rotary, and your inspiring words have truly motivated us to continue our service uh, journey with renewed vigor. I would like uh, also to thank the organizing committee and volunteers who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure the smooth running of this webinar. Your dedication and hard work have not gone unnoticed and we are truly grateful for all that you have done. Last but not least, a big thank you to all our participants for your active participation thoughtful questions and valuable contributions. It is uh, your engagement that has made this webinar a meaningful and enriching experience for all of us. As we conclude this webinar, let us carry forward the spirit of Rotary and continue to make a positive impact in our communities and beyond. Thank you once again to everyone involved and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our future Rotary events. Together, let us continue to serve humanity and uh, create magic in the world. Thank you. Thank you.